the Irish American Writers and Arts, you'll be most welcome to join us. We are not Irish, really. We are not American. What we are concentrating on mostly is your artistry. So songsters, guitar players, dancers, painters, poets, and novelists, any art that you have, you are welcome. So our business is love of art, love of each other, and have love, life, laughter. Welcome. Welcome to another Zoom salon for Irish American writers and artists. Our mission is a vital mission. We celebrate the achievements of Irish Americans, writers and artists, both past and present. And we aim to highlight and energize and encourage Irish Americans active in the arts. We support artistic freedom, human rights, and social justice. I'm Lori Castles, and I'm coming to you from Alameda, California, and I am so delighted to, to be hosting and co-hosting this salon. And it's our uh, transcontinental salon, international salon. We will be having people from Ireland and um, the East Coast and Alameda, California. And right now I'd like to introduce Catherine Barry of the Irish Cultural, Irish, Irish Bay, uh, Bay Area Cultural. So she's gonna tell you because uh, she'll do a better job than I. Hi, I'm Catherine Barry, Irish Culture Bay Area, and um, it's, this is lovely. Thank you all for attending, and um, thank you, Brendan and Laurie, for you've done some incredible work over the last few weeks getting this together. Um, if COVID has done anything reasonably okay, this is one thing that it's managed to unite us over Zoom and over continents um, to do this kind of thing, and I hope it will continue after the the virus has left us, which hopefully will be soon. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you all. And um, it's a pleasure to do this and I hope we can continue this West Coast um, collaboration. Yes, that's a, a name of ours. And how this day will proceed is Catherine and I will be co-hosting and so each of us will be taking turns in introducing. So let's get this show started. We'll be showcasing people, as I said, poets, writers, musicians, and our first um, uh, feature will be Dara Carr. And Dara Carr is the artistic director of Dara Carr Dance, which is a contemporary Irish step dance company based in New York City that specializes in this unique, this is, I love this, it's called Mod Erin. So it's a unique blend of traditional Irish step music and modern dance. Um, Dara Carr is the assistant professor and the Conservatory of Dance in Purchase College. Dara, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lori. Happy to be here with you all today. Coming to you from Michigan, um, traveling myself. So we're uniting different time zones here all together. So the following dance film that you're about to see is an excerpt of an evening length work entitled Dancing the Great Arc which premiered at New York City's Irish Arts Center in November 2018 and features fiddler Dana Lynn, guitarist Kyle Sanna, and Derek Cardan's couple members, Michelle Esch, Kendall Griffler, Jonathan Matthews, Melissa Padamas, and Alexandra Williamson. Together, we perform a choreographic exploration of Dana and Kyle's second album, The Great Arc. Inspired by biodiversity and dedicated to extinct and endangered animal species, the dynamic concept album creates a musical narrative that celebrates our ecosystem while calling attention to the urgent need for its protection. Known for taking a quote through the looking glass approach to their artistic process, Dana and Kyle connect the dots between their experiences as composers and improvisers in New York City's rich musical community and their deep admiration for traditional music. The great arc features inventive arrangements and nuanced interpretations of traditional Irish music. Mirroring their blend of tradition and innovation, Derek Cardance vividly reimagines Irish dance and music in our trademark style of Mod Aaron, a unique fusion of traditional Irish step, 
and contemporary modern dance. Through the inclusion of floor work, arm and torso movements, and intricate partnering, our choreography expands the boundaries of Irish dance vocabulary. We hope you enjoyed the video, and if you're interested in seeing more of our work, please note that Dana, Kyle, myself, and Sean Kern are currently collaborating on a new piece to premiere at the New Irish Arts Centre in Midtown Manhattan this fall 2022. Thanks again for having me today, and enjoy.
Fabulous, Dara Carr. Wonderful stuff. And those dancers are, that's my kind of river dance, actually. I like it. Um, and Kyle Sana and Dana Lynn have been out here a few times over the years and well worth checking out for anyone who doesn't know them. Um, that's a nice start. Thank you, Laurie. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna get started with our writer lineup. And Evelyn, I believe, is here somewhere. Yes, she is. Hi, Evelyn. <laughs> um, Evelyn Conlon is a novelist, short story writer, anthologist, and she's really one of Ireland's truly original voices. So we're very honored to have you here today. Um, she's written about secret lives, double standards, capital punishment, famine, borders, sex and lies. So if that's not enough for us, I don't know what is. Her, her last novel, she was, um, I was very honored to have her at a writer's festival I put on in, in Los Gatos, California. And at the time um, we heard from Evelyn about her recently published novel about Irish famine orphan girls who were shipped to Australia. Um, and her latest collection also, there's a bit of an Australian theme going on lately with Evelyn. Her, her recent collection includes another novella, um, How Things Are With Hannah these days, set in 1970s Australia. So her work is very, very fascinating, um, learn a lot. Um, available on Kindle and Amazon and all the, the usual places. Um, and I, I see too, your work, Evelyn, has been translated most recently into Mandarin and Tamil. So I'm sure you didn't do that yourself. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's great to have you. You might want to tell us a little bit about what you have, what you're working on, what's coming up and what you'd like to share with us today. So, okay. OK, listen, thank you very much, Catherine. And hello to everybody, whatever part of the world you're in. And of course, I am reading, uh, speaking to you from Dublin. Um, so what I thought I would do, really, I'm going to read from the last collection, which came out last year, which is called Moving About the Place. And the, the, the notion of it being called that is because the stories are it's set in a lot of different places. <laughs> so... Uh, and you can you can find more about it on the website and whatever it's it's I don't want to I suppose explain too much but it goes all over the place and it includes some stories that are historically based. For instance, I have a story written about Violet Gibson, who is the Irish woman who tried to assassinate Mussolini. And I also have another one about an Irish woman who was very involved in the suffrage movement in South Australia, originally from my own county, so I kind of became interested in her. But anyway, what I thought I would do this evening for you is to uh, read the beginnings of two stories. It's a bit difficult because when you're not reading a full story, it doesn't really make sense. But, you know, we can always manage to get you the end of the story if you really need to know it. Um, I thought I would read about reading, about books. So I'm just going to read you the beginning of two different stories and, and both of them have a theme of reading. So this one is called The Reading of It. And essentially it's about a young woman who takes her neighbor into the workshop and has read him wrong. Although it's actually about reading books as well. The air outside had the teas of spring, faint, ever so faint, like the faraway goat's bell in a Swiss mountain story. If you put your nose up, you could get a whiff of the jasmine planted by our neighbour, him hoping to be just that little bit above the rest of us. He had more of those thoughts up his sleeve and could be seen tossing them around in that pointy head of his. Anyone could get the smell of jasmine, but you could miss daffodils if you didn't come from country stock because it takes a lot of them, an entire congregation, you might say, to give off any kind of smell. There's a girl in a Jamaica Kincaid story, a Caribbean Islander. She was au pair for a couple in New York, so white they could almost be seen through. The woman of the house thought she was being kind and kept telling the girl 
of the great surprise she had in store for her next week, tomorrow, today, today. Yes, it's today. She took her to the park, made her close her eyes at the gates, let her in and then whispered, open, open. Now look, oh look, the daffodils, aren't they just so beautiful? I hate daffodils, the girl said, and she did because back home in school, they had been made to learn too many daffodil poems, even though they had never seen the flower. Their old colonizer had thought this a good plan. After independence, the new rulers hadn't got around to changing the curriculum. These things can't be done overnight. No daffodils grew on her island. I hate daffodils, she said again. But then she looked closer with interest because she had never thought that they would look like that. A lot of fuss over a very small flower, she thought. And then the story goes on to him going into the class and what he writes and how that transpires. So it's about the reading of it. So now I'll come to one and I'll read you three pages of this. And this story is called Disturbing Words. And it's really about the notion of words being disturbing themselves, but also this particular person shifting about words to disturb them. And it's, it's about borders. Um, I was weird, uh, brought up in County Monaghan, so I would be very aware of the notion of border. And it's about somebody who has traveled around borders in different parts of the world. So it's really about borders and about words. It's really about words, actually, we say. So it's called Disturbing Words. I know you're wondering what I'm doing up here, not just up here, but here at all. The last you'd heard of me, I was away out foreign someplace, so foreign that you don't even know the name of it. And that's a hard thing to achieve these days when there is always some lurker beside you with infinite information on his telephone, as well as his entire life. Infinite does mean that there's no end to it, which is never a good thing. You mention a place, the strangeness of it lovingly on your tongue. It's faraway mysteries tucked into the silence that you're trying to leave around it. And your man has whipped out his gadget. How do you spell that, he bellows? Perhaps not bellows, but it feels like it. The roaring cult of the amateur know-it-all. Your youth was gloriously lived with the photographs kept in an album and only taken out if there was a reason to do so. Something to check or an emigrant visiting. Something to do with them when the talk of their growing children and their new fridge had run out of steam. <clears throat> Actually, in all honesty, it's so long since you heard the last of me, I could have been dead. And you're right. I have been away in a peculiar place, almost desert really, a place with red earth, spindly bits of mangy grass and heat that is laughable and a neighbor whose job is building underground car parks in mosques. But I had come home for my parents' funeral, funerals, naturally. And I say home when I'm here because it's easier. Demanding that someone call my air conditioned desert pad home would be a bit much. My parents had died within a day of each other and luckily enough, the first funeral hadn't taken place, so the two wakes were held together. In the passing around of the word, it got mixed up which of them had gone first, but it didn't really matter, not to the outsiders, but it did to me. But over the few days, the more I accepted condolences, even I got confused as to which of them had died of the broken heart. But I could have worked it out by trying to remember who was named when my phone went in Abu Dhabi. Because I was on my way home after hearing about the first, when they rang to tell me about the second. I had thought that they were just checking to see how my flights were going so far. No delays, that sort of thing. So they begin to talk about language. For as long as they could remember, my father was a pernickety sort of man, particularly around language, and my mother seemed to follow suit. Although some of the women weren't sure if the following suit was a sleight of hand, they thought it might have been her who had started it. 
She was known as a reader. Serious reading hid in her very nerves. She got terribly annoyed about the man who had come walking here when he was writing a book. He had lied about things she had told him. When she brought it up with the women, they could see that it mattered more to her than it did to them. Imagine pretending when there was no need to, she said indignantly, as if we wouldn't find out, as if we didn't read on the border. They nodded their heads towards her. She spoke the truth. And now they were gathered, talking their ways through the shock of both of them dead. Remember the time he dressed you down for saying UK, someone called to Jerry Moore. And Jerry, who was a perfect mimic, brought my father's voice straight into the room. Let's not get lazy. It's England or Britain if you want. United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, not around here. And as for an Ulster Scot, that's a Monaghan woman in Edinburgh. Scotch-Irish, that's how it goes. If we mind our language, the rest will follow. And we all stayed quiet in honour of the man who had thought that language mattered and the woman who liked the sound of truth. Hey. That'd be very good, amazing. Thank you, Evelyn, so, so much. Um, I just always love how you read. You read, it's so commanding. Um, and now we're coming back, we're leaving Ireland and we're coming back to America and uh, from the East Coast. I know him from Washington DC area, but he tells me he's at the beach now. Um, a, I'd like to welcome John McNamee. And he's worked for almost three decades in the U, for the US government as a researcher and editor in the field of economic development, which we need, we need him to stay and do more of, and has been researching local Irish history for now more than 40 years. His primary interest is in the history and culture of rural County Longford, where he grew up. Welcome, John McNamee. Thank you very much, Laurie. I, I think I'm on. <laughs> you are. Indeed. Do I? Am I on it? Yeah? Yes. OK. Mar I wrote Marriage on an Irish Farm as a, a summary of about 40 years of investigating the history of a rural community, an impoverished rural community during the Great Depression and World War II. And the, the, what I started out with is the fact that I grew up there, spent 18 years, the first 18 years of my life there. And I concluded that those are among the most wonderful people that I have ever met. They were people of very simple everything, very limited education, very limited financial condition, et cetera. Um, over those 40 years, I spent a lot of time in Ireland checking up on land records, school records, uh, church records, marriages, births, bapti baptisms, deaths. I inv interviewed extensively old neighbors and friends and spent a lot of time in the archives of the Longford Leader that recounted all the local events once a week. Uh, I would like to read just a few paragraphs of, of my conclusions after doing all of that and putting it in the context of who these people were. In today's world, there's great fascination with the lives of the powerful, rich, and famous. Until recently, the lives of ordinary people were seldom of interest to historians. The history set forth in, the, in these pages is one of a marginal rural Irish community in the middle of the 20th century. The significant events, as well as the social, cultural, and economic forces that influenced it. It's the story of ordinary people, people who kept no written record of their lives, except unintentionally in the rare family heirlooms they saved. There were no note takers to record their thoughts or deeds. They lived lives of dignity, generosity, and happiness only incidentally related to material things. They were the backbone of a very caring society. It was a time before radio and television, cars and electricity. Telephones and indoor plumbing changed that way of life forever. 
The community was built on cooperation out of necessity as much as choice, where people survive together or not at all. At the individual level, it is portrayed from the vantage point of one family, my family, the story of my parents beginning with their marriage in 1936. It chronicles the changing world of two women who were brought together when the older woman's son became the younger woman's husband. The house and kitchen that was the older woman's kingdom for decades was handed over to the younger, part of the social compact inherent in every marriage in the area at that time. It is the story of two women, honorable, intelligent, and family-centered, of two lives often in conflict because of the reality of life at the time and the adjustments circumstances forced upon them. Theirs was a struggle to share the same space, the same fireside, the same farm kitchen in the isolation of rural Irish community. It was partly a conflict of age and generation, partly the inevitable result of two human beings being forced to share the same work and living space all their waking hours. Although a commonplace phenomenon in rural Ireland at the time, it was a new experience for these two. At the broader level, their story is intertwined with the history of Kerglass in North Longford. Life in Kerglass was typical of poor rural communities across Ireland, is uncertain weather and almost certain immigration for many. They lived their lives by certain fundamental beliefs. They were religious people and every day of their lives, they remembered and celebrated and practiced that religion. Religion provided the framework of who and what they were and expressed and defined their values. For them, religion had a direct social implication. The individual's uncompromising pursuit of heaven served the common good on earth. What is right is good for one and all. They were happy to the extent they spared no effort to do what was right. They were deeply religious, but never fanatical. They had a simple limited view of economics. They worked hard be always and earned just about everything they had. Being poor was a fact of life, but not a reason for unhappiness. They worked hard and worked smart and gave top priority to the quality of life in the household and in the neighborhood. They knew instinctively that what life was a mixed bag. They accepted that some people were lucky. They didn't measure success in terms of fame or fortune. Like most of their neighbors, no amount of wealth would have made them happier or more fulfilled. Either their limited economic wealth nor modest education diminished that or made them feel inferior to anyone. They were low key and self-effacing. Most of all, they were a team. The world of Kerglass in the middle of the 20th century no longer exists. It is not just thatched houses and horse-drawn farm equipment that are gone. A way of life has disappeared. It was often hard, even harsh, eking out an existence from too little land in uncertain weather, but it was a way of life where surviving was a communal effort. Variation in diet and fashion and clothes played very little role. The modern world was making only modest inroads. It's tempting to take a romantic view of rural Ireland then, especially in an area with as much natural beauty as North Longford has. But weeding vegetables, picking potatoes, spreading turf, and a thousand other chores were no more fun when the view was one a tourist would pay good money to gaze at. In fact, the natural beauty of the valley where they lived usually went unnoticed. And I would add to that, I. I started out thinking about my mother and grandmother and their conflicts, and I'm wondering why they were such terrible people. I ended up realizing that no two human beings could be placed in the same environment when all their waking moments in every 24 hours for many, many, for their entire lifetime, really, and not be, and have to, to deal with that under very limited means. It's, it's a role that was primarily the problem for women in Ireland that they had to face that. Uh, the men were off on the farm working. They were not under each other's feet constantly. I came away from it appreciating that both were strong women, but I came away from it as appreciating that the, 
the whole community produced unbelievably generous human beings. Thank you. Thank you, John. Wow, that's incredible. Um, this is a subject very close to my heart. I'm involved in an Irish oral history project here at the Crossroads Oral History Archive. I'll put the website link in the chat so people can check it out. Um, yeah, the way of life might be gone, but I think, you know, these stories are so important because we still have much to learn and we still can learn a lot from, from this life that went before us. So um, well done and all that work. It's a lot of Thank you. It's a lot of work trying to dig out this information, but um, it's fascinating stuff. I, I just love it. Um, okay, so now we are we're coming up on a break after this for bathroom break, but now we we are going to meet uh, Tina Eck and Keith Carr. Going to have a little bit of music. Um, they're both am I echoing? My, my sound okay? okay okay yeah, yeah. um they're, they're <laughs> on myself, on myself. It's, it's really, really annoying, annoying but i just keep talking um this duo have been together for a decade and they've recorded and released a, a, at least four albums i believe um tina's a, a german native um and plays flute and keith is an irish bazooki um and tenor banjo player so um Keith, you might like to let us know what exactly an Irish bazooki is before you guys get started. And then uh, we look forward to listening to your, your music and welcome to, welcome to you both. And that flute looks fabulous. So we're excited. excited. To see thank you, thank you. you play. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me uh, unmute myself here. Okay, um, <clears throat> an Irish bazooki, you ask. It looks like a guitar, but that's only this one. Uh, generally, they're, they're instruments that are in the lute family. They typically have a pear-shaped body or a teardrop-shaped body. Um, double strung, you can probably see that if you can, you know, I think it may come across through the, through the camera. But pairs of strings, uh, like a mandolin, and in fact, it's, it's related to the mandolin. It's a very large <laughs> mandolin. Uh, this one happens to have 10 strings. Um, Generally, they have eight strings, uh, but this one was made for me uh, by a fellow in Germany, uh, and uh, I asked for it to be built with the body of a guitar. So we call this the gazuki, or the buzar. <laughs> okay, so we'll play some tunes for you.
comes with some jigs on the front. Oh, fabulous. Uh, thank you. And, uh, German Irish music. Never says German it. Irish music with a German accent, yeah. Uh, we're coming to you from Washington, D.C., by the way. It's very, very hot here. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. So, absolutely. We're going to play one more set on the whistle and the. Keys. We all clap. Uh, it'll sound like a lot more people because of the. <laughs> Nice, a nice end to the first 
the first half of the program and uh, we take a quick break and we're going to um, start off the second half with not to be missed a poet old friend of mine fellow Dubliner Caroline Bracken don't miss this go have a pee and a cup of coffee and come back <laughs> thank you so much we'll be probably back in about 10 minutes or if anyone else sometimes people talk amongst themselves um, Uh, yeah, uh, this is Brendan uh, speaking from the void. I just wanted to uh, say, first of all, a big thanks to everybody for coming out and for being such good Zoom citizens and staying muted when people are presenting and everything. You guys are doing great. You're the real stars. Um, but the uh, but um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll have a couple of I'll, I'll I have a couple of announcements. I'm gonna I'll, I'll either pass you or I'll make when we come back, but. Please, by all means, I'm just leaving the uh, the thing on spotlit so everybody can feel free to chat as they will, and uh, we'll you know re reconvene in a few minutes. But wonderful to have everybody with us today, and thank you so much for all for joining us. This is an empty envelope. You don't need this, right? And uh, uh, you don't need it. Yeah. Check it now. Are people chatting? No, no one. Typically, people do, and no one is. And I'm on mute. Uh, Evelyn, I see you wrote, can you let those people know we hear them just in case they got into a riff? Oh, you mean the people who were just speaking? <laughs> Sorry, didn't realize. All yes, right. exactly. People who were just speaking, they could have started to talk about us all. <laughs> we could um, realize that we could hear them. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think you understand how this game is played, apparently. <laughs> uh, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, that's, this is all just a giant trap, um, you know, to, to catch you saying something. It's also why, you know, the, I mean, there's a joke about this in some way, like why, you know, people always end up staying late at the bars because you're always afraid when you leave, everyone's going to talk about you, right? So it works, it works for cults, it works for alcoholism, and it works for a Zoom salon. It's fantastic. It's um, very interesting because I've, I've, I've had it, I've seen it happen, people who in the middle of a Zoom think that they've switched off and, and they've begun to talk about everybody else. Um, yeah, that's... And then... Uh, oh. so you're, you're in the, uh, the snake pit of... Uh, you're in the snake pit of academia there, which I'm sure has its own, uh, <laughs> its own pitfalls in that regard. But that's, that is a, another thing that actually has been happening. In addition to all the sort of the, the higher profile, like, nightmare... Uh, uh things Without your conduct on, on, on yeah. stuff, you know but um while i while we're chatting i just want to make this announcement and we'll put it i'll put it into the um uh i'll put it into the uh chat as well but 
Um, our annual uh, fundraiser is our uh, Eugene O'Neill Lifetime Achievement Award celebration, where we honor a person of prominence in the Irish American arts community. This year, our honoree is going to be Larry Kerwan, who uh, is our former, actually former president of the organization, and also, um, uh, you know, leader and founder of Black Forty Seven, as well as. Uh, He's become, you know, internationally recognized as a uh, uh, as a playwright and uh, you know creator of musicals. Uh, his uh, play uh, Paradise Square just recently uh, won several Tonys on Broadway. Although it's it's, it's closing in New York, but hopefully going to be going on tour uh, soon. But um, that actually played out in Berkeley before it uh, uh, debuted in New York in a slightly different format. The uh, the cast is amazing. The the construction of the uh, the show is actually really remarkable. And Bill T. Jones, the famous choreographer, uh, is was also very involved in the project. And so it's 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 really it's really worth uh, looking into and checking out. And if nothing else, go to um, uh, look up on YouTube the uh, performance from the Tony Awards of uh, the uh, lead actress. Uh, the the song she did just floored the. I mean, I when I saw it in in person, it, it blew everybody away. But uh, you don't usually see um, the audience at the Tony Awards giving a standing ovation to somebody who's doing a song. Just extraordinary, really extraordinary. Um, more coming up sooner than that. Actually, I we we're, we're also doing a. Uh, uh, a first annual humor salon, and it's going to be actually at the Friars Club in New York. Um, and we are actually, even though tickets just went on sale uh, early last week, uh, we're actually almost, it's a very limited uh, set of tickets we were, we were able to offer. Uh, and that's almost uh, sold out, but that's going to be a, uh, a really cool event. In September, there is a big poetry festival in New York City, actually um, in Governor's Island or on Governor's Island. Um, and uh, we're going to have a table at that, and there'll be more about that on our website and on our Facebook page, um, and uh, we'll figure all that out. Um, and um, we have other events coming up, including, uh, Lori, you're going to be, uh, at some point, we're going to have a, a salon based around uh, Eugene O'Neill because of the work you've been doing mm -hmm. um, at the, uh, the O'Neill home out in the uh, is it, it's not in Alameda, right? Where's, where's No, like it's in Danville, California. And uh, you have the, um, Eric um, um, Hayes, who is the uh, artistic director, who said he'd, he'd be helping out. And so did Con Connor Begley, um, who is an, a member. Yeah, and um, it's member. Still, yeah, it's still in the works. We're thinking of doing it around October when Eugene O'Neill's birthday was, which was October 19th. Cool, very good. Oh, I should mention also that the, the poetry festival I mentioned earlier is uh, the weekend of September 10th and 11th. Um, so if you happen to be in New York or want to find out where Governor's Island is, um, it's it's a it's an island right in the middle of New York Harbor that uh, I was basically unaware of for a large portion of my life, even though it is literally like it's basically almost in between or counter kitty corner between like. Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Liberty Island. It's it, it was it was for a long time it was sort of owned and run by the um, the Coast Guard, and so essentially, I guess people just kind of ignored it. I don't know. It's very bizarre. Uh, but they've been doing a, a poetry festival uh, once a year out there, and it's kind of a it's become a real kind of a big big deal and a cool thing. Um, I'm not sure how we are on time in terms of when you want to when you guys want to start again. I think maybe. Give, people a, a couple more minutes to uh you know freshen up your drinks and, and whatnot and uh we can get going again if you don't mind i'm just gonna give you one little bit of trivia i was at a reading last night downtown in new york and many perhaps remember this that you know in in the poetry in the poetry scene right for beatniks and proto future neo beatniks it's pop it's popular to snap instead of clap that actually came from a very uh, particular place and situation. Uh, and I'm just gonna throw it out there. Does anyone know the story of why beatniks yeah. snap instead of clap? 
it came from the Gaslight, the club on McDougal Street, because there was a little old lady who lived like on like the fifth floor, uh, who was always complaining because they would only have acoustic music and like poetry readings, but the applause was always too loud. So she was always complaining about the applause. And then years later, um, so the so snapping instead of clapping was the was the thing, and that became like the industry standard for beatniks across the country and around the world or whatever. But the uh, the bar eventually became a, a punk club. And uh, I knew a guy who had been a bartender there for a while and told me the story of how they were trying to soundproof it and the lady was still complaining and complaining. And they finally figured out that there was a an air shaft that was basically piping the sound directly into this person's house. So uh, even though she may have seemed like a classic New York crank, she was actually, she actually had a legitimate <laughs> you know, beef, but we can give her some snaps for, for creating that tradition. Um, just a little fun rando trivia for you there. David, before we start again, do, do you want to do a quick uh, check? You look, sound good. I mean, you look good. You look like you sound fine. <laughs> for six hours. <laughs> okay. The big hand of the mighty clock goes turning fast and faster. Where has the time gone? I don't know. The hourglass no one can master. Sounds good. Anyway, so a little, a little, a little promo, a little preview for. Uh, for <laughs> right. Consider a bonus uh, or a penalty. Penal bonus or penalty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds great. Though. Sounds very good. Uh, do we want to get going again? Are we good to go? I'm ready. I think Catherine is up for intro. Are yep. ready? Okay. I'm ready. ready to jump back into this. This is fun so far. I hope everyone's having a good time. Mm -hmm. And um, okay. so welcome, Caroline Bracken. Uh, okay. So welcome, Caroline Bracken. Um, like I said, old, old buddy of mine, um, fantastic poet, um, mm -hmm. fellow Dubliner. And um, Caroline has been published in the Belfield Literary Review, the Twitter Magazine, the Irish Times, the Honest Ulsterman, and, and several others. Um, she's got some forthcoming in the New England Review. Um, she was selected for the Poetry Ireland Introduction Series in 2018, and she's received an Agility Award from the Arts Council of Ireland um, last year, and, and a, an Emerging Artist Award from the Leary Arts Office this year. Um, and some weird thing, Caroline, you might tell us about, um, it's funny how poetry in Ireland can show up anywhere. I know they had some public um, poetry cubicles around the city. Uh, that's probably not the right word. Caroline, you might um, tell us yeah. a little bit about that and then, then we'll hear some of your work and, and great to see you. Yeah, you too, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, that's the poetry jukebox, uh, it's, uh, operated by a girl from Northern Ireland um, where you record a poem and it's up on the jukebox. They had one, I had a poem on one down uh, outside the, the Epic Museum um, and it went to Paris then as well. So it's a great, great initiative. So uh, I'm just going to read four poems for you tonight. Um, uh, the first one, I'm going to start with a bit of history. And uh, sure, you all know the Easter Rising in 1916, and I was very excited to find out that um, some of my uh, husband's family were actually fighting in it, a uh, father and son, uh, both called John Bracken. And this poem is called Strange Weather, and it's in the voice of the son who was 18 at the time. Strange weather. A hail of bullets, the paper said, like it was freak weather, a blast of winter in late April. They didn't bounce or dance or melt away on your tongue. One got me in the cheekbone. Dug in at Mount Street Bridge, firing at Sherwood Foresters. I felt no pain till my mate said I was raining blood. Meanwhile, me da stretched Connolly into the GPO. An ambulance man, the papers called him. 
like my ma, unnamed, on her knees at home in Lennox Street. The click click of her rosary beads, Hail Mary full of grace. My baby sister clapping in time. My three brothers answering, their voices not yet broken. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Granda in bed cursing his legs, listening for hailstones, willing a change in wind direction. Pray for us sinners. The papers didn't report the sun coming out as I walked home by the Grand Canal or my ma's face when my, my da walked in the door without a mark on him. They only wrote about the storm breaking over Kilmainham now and at the hour of our death. So this next one is uh, about a place in California that Catherine took me to a few years ago. And it's called Hillsburg, California. There are lizards here. They don't seem real. More like toy reptiles my sons collected in their phase between dinosaurs and power rangers. I am here for healing among redwoods, which list towards the Russian river. One has grown almost horizontal in its longing for water. It'll do you good, and it should. Who could resist a fawn eating the last summer apples within touching distance? Oblivious to my presence on the balcony of this wooden house built to withstand floods and earthquakes. You deserve it. And if beauty alone could cure, I would be discarded. A heron stands at the water's edge, waits for the right moment to dive, to catch the fish off guard. Squirrels scratch at the walls outside at night sending Morse code I don't understand. At dawn, my eyes scan the trees for mountain lions, but none appear. Perhaps I have not learned the art of stillness yet. The midday sun is strong, strong enough to dry my hair and heat my bones, though fall is in the air. A yellow-legged frog watches me from a rock. His stone-coloured head nods. Yes, stay a while. You're one of us. And uh, this poem I wrote, and when I was doing a course today, some of you might know the, that Oscar Wilde's old house uh, on Western Road is now um, owned by Trinity uh, School of English, and they run courses there. And I was doing a course, and... Uh, the tutor told us to look out the window and write a poem. So, change. From the second floor of Oscar Wilde's house, I watched the space where I sat an hour ago in the window of Il Café de Napoli, sipping a double shot Americano. The panes were scratched, my vision distorted. The homeless guy who sat outside Centra is gone. The only trace of him, a compostable coffee cup I did not throw coins into. Any spare change. Horse-drawn trams the infant Oscar must have seen no longer trouble Westland Row. The street is uncobbled. No top hats or frock coats. Yet he would recognize this view the way the light falls on the railway bridge. If he closed his eyes and listened long enough, he would know he was home the moment he heard a voice calling any spare change. And I leave you with a bit of humour. Um, myself and Catherine grew up uh, not too far from where Samuel Beckett grew up and obviously he's revered here as a genius um, but no one gives a second thought to his long-suffering mother 
who I imagine as typical Irish mummy whose son has her heart scalded. So this uh, is in the voice of Mrs. Beckett and it's called Beckett's Ma's Last Tape. My son is not a bird, but he inherited my eagle nose and fondness for turtleneck sweaters, crow black cashmere. I am his cash cow, funding his finding of himself in London. Two years with a shrink who pronounces that I am the source of all my son's problems. So it's only fair that I support him to arse around Paris, drinking whiskey and playing chess. And by the way, getting himself attacked on the left bank. Not just any old mugging, but stabbed by a pimp of all things. I fly to his bedside. I was a nurse in my day. Only to be told I'm smothering him, if you don't mind. And from now on, he's writing in French. English isn't good enough for him. I suppose I should be thankful it's not Irish. And no one here will understand it or his first book, More Pricks Than Kicks, which the censor had the sense to ban. Last week, he sent word to say he's joining the resistance. The resistance? I'd say the Germans are shaking in their jackboots. That lad couldn't resist a second slice of chocolate cake. Please God, after the war, he'll give up his notions and come home to Fox Rock and take up his old job as a lecturer in Trinity College, Dublin. He's over 40 now, and this is getting beyond a joke. Thank you. Wow, that's very funny, very funny. And Irish mothers, Jesus. And um, little did I know, Caroline, that you were brewing all that wonderful work when we were sitting by the river in Healesburg. I thought we were just chatting about the lizards and then <laughs> that's beautiful. I never heard that before. It almost brought yeah. tears to my eyes. Beautiful piece. Thanks Thank you. Captain. Thank you. The great Very selection. Good. And I believe I have the, the next intro. Thank you. Carolyn, that was so wonderful. I I was I, I was with you in Russian River and uh, I was praying along with you on your first on your first poem. That was really, really beautiful. Um, um, and we're staying in Ireland and coming to us from, I believe, Donegal, um, but he'll, he'll tell us because I think he's going to fill in a little more intro because what I have for Joseph Pierce Jones, an actor and a very passionate Irish language teacher. And I learned today to say that he's very Greg, Greg Holt, Greg Holt, and he'll correct me because that's what his job is. He's my Irish. He is uh, Shasu, my... Um, Irish language teacher that I see every every Sunday. He's coming uh, to us from Donegal and he's going to be doing a dramatic reading. And please, Joseph, let us a little know more about what you do in your life. You're, uh, you're just one of my most fun teachers and I'm thrilled that you said yes. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me, all of you. Gurmila Mayalgo. So, um, yes, I'm actually in Belfast right now. I was in Donegal yesterday, so I'm all over the place. Last week I was in uh, Leicester, and then I was in London as well, and then I was in New York. So I'm just all over right now. But so I'm in Belfast. Um, yes, so I am an actor, model, and also um, I work a lot with the Irish language. I obviously teach for the Irish Arts Centre and the New York Irish Centre. Manhattan and then in Queens and I also work with uh, Block TG Cahar so I create uh, content for young people through the language trying to put it uh, kin, trying to put it forward and uh, yeah it was just in the Gale Talk so my head is very Irish language head right now but um, it is an English piece so don't worry you won't have to you know about all your schooling and maybe your, your, your bad things you have to say about the language uh, you won't have to say it with this anyway because it's in English but Anyway, um, no, so uh, this piece is a club by um, Grant Corr. Um, 
which is a new piece. Uh, Grand Court is a Belfast uh, playwright based in London. We actually had um, a staged play reading at the New York Irish Centre at the end of June. It's a queer piece, two person piece. We play multiple characters and this is a monologue from it. I am doing um, a reading of it. So um, I hope uh, you all enjoy it. We had to do this research thing in citizenship. It was to do with civil rights. Touchy kind of subject in Northern Ireland, but uh, deadly important. So loads of people in my class looked at American civil rights. Some people looked at here, started the troubles with some woman called Bernadette Devlin and all that. And I decided to look at gay rights. Not really interested in all that other stuff. Just the same old shit, you know what I mean? And gay rights is my history. And it's stuff that no one ever sets you down and tells you about. I know all about the Anglo-Saxons and about how they made their houses and their dinner plates, but I know nothing about gay rights or famous gay people. It's like, it's not important enough. So I had to go and do my own research to find stuff out. And my head explodes with the stuff that I find out. The Gay Rights Association of Northern Ireland single-handedly took on the British government in the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ. Why didn't I know about this stuff? Like, this is actually dead interesting, so relevant to our history. And it was all about the decriminalization of homosexuality back in the day. In the rest of the UK, being gay was decriminalized in 1967. But that didn't extend to Northern Ireland, no even though we're a part of the same country, supposedly. So this guy who was working for the Northern Irish Gay Rights Association, Jeff, he was called, uh, thought it was unfair for gays living in Northern Ireland. So he bought his money where his mouth was and he went to the European court and he won his fucking case. I mean, that is inspiring. That's awesome. And when I read it, it made me feel like I was, like I was important. The DUP tried to stop him from winning this case. They had this uh, campaign called Save Ulster from Sodomy. And basically what it meant was that they were trying to keep Northern Ireland pure for when Jesus Christ came back to the earth so that there was at least one place on this planet still upholding Christian values. I mean, seriously, like get a grip. No one comes to Northern Ireland, not really. They go to Dublin when they visit Ireland. So like the DUP really need to rethink that one, big thing. And what did they think? Jesus Christ was gonna jump on the Belfast Express from Dublin and what, do a black taxi tour of all the trouble spots and see the murals? And what, go to the Titanic and do a Game of Thrones tour? <laughs> oh, anyway, they didn't win that time, thankfully. Uh, the European court ordered them to do the right thing by the gays and be in line with the rest of the UK. How many people in Northern Ireland actually know about this stuff? Hardly any, no one in my class knew, me included. I had to go and do my own research to find that out. Wonderful, powerful stuff. Are we good here, sound-wise? Thank you, Joseph. Um, very Thank powerful. You. Very powerful. Uh, Subject matter is, is not at all funny, but that was very amusing. Um, Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Kathy Kremens, um, who's from Newark, New Jersey. Um, Irish immigrant parents, a daughter of Irish immigrant parents. She's a retired public school teacher and coach. Her first chapbook, Undressing the World, was recently published by Finishing Line Press. Um, so welcome, Kathy. I don't see you on the line up here. I take it you're here somewhere. Here I am. <laughs> oh, good. Um, welcome. And tell us a little bit about, um, before you get started, about uh, your parents, where they were from, in a nutshell, and, and the influence they've had on your work and your person that you are today. We look forward to hearing from you. 
Thank you. It, it's it's really truly amazing um, being here, and I want to thank Lori. I, I actually met Lori about three weeks ago in a in a, another Zoom situation. Um, I'm an assistant editor at uh, Platform Review, and Lori has two. Um, if she's not mentioned this, there's two just poignant and excellent poems in the most um, recent Platform Review. Um, a poem called People and a poem called Surgery. And I just wanted to make sure, make sure I, I gave a shout out to Lori because they, I've been rereading those poems over and over again. Um, and they certainly have resonated with me. Um, I, um, my, my mom was born in uh, Clune Can, County Roscommon. Um, came here um, after World War II. Um, it was, uh, you know, the, it's, it's bog, bog territory. Uh, my dad came here, um, he was very young um, and he was from Cork City. And um, I have family uh, still in Ireland, um, grew up in the Irish section of Newark. And much of um, my recent uh, writing um, has to do with um, very specifically that immigrant experience and, and, and being Irish. And um, I'm currently at work on a, a full collection um, it, which is entitled Shanty. So um, the the uh, hopefully it'll it'll be out in the world someday. Uh, I'm going to read two poems. Um, the first one is actually the poem um, that I read in the, when when Lori and I met for the first time, and it, it was the first poem that I wrote in um, 2022. So it's a, a very recent poem, and then I'm going to read um, from my chapbook collection with which also just came out. This is what happens when you retire, right? All of these things that you've been writing for so long. Oh, now here we go. Um, but uh, I'm going, going to read the opening poem um, from uh, my chat book, um, Undressing the World. So I'll start with the, with the new poem, um, which is called What Kind of Chat? Been thinking about language, what structures of diction, syntax, grammar, punctuation, control how we touch with words. Learning Irish, finally freed from the forbidden my parents endured, colonized education left for dead, but rising up as the people their selves keep doing. Verb-driven actions precede subject, precede object, imagine the world without yes or no. What kind of chat begins with such useless little words, too polarizing, too stagnant, Isolated from the heart, the banter needed to start the grand old conversation, a response followed by a few questions or better, a story bursting with ancestors. Imagine a land where our tongues weave in agam, for we are all poets, unbound, unleashed spring tides, they, them, us, we. And I'm supposed to, apparently I'm supposed to show the cover of my book. <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm pretty bad at promotion, um, but uh, it's uh, this, this, that's me. There's my mother um, and a good friend of mine who also grew up in Newark, um, who lived in the Ironbound. She's, fr she's from Portuguese immigrant parents. Um, she designed the cover. She took a photograph of, of my mom and I that had been taken actually out in uh, Branchbrook Park in front of Sacred Heart Cathedral and she imposed it on uh, the Broad Market Street um, of Newark. Um, and then there I am in the back. <laughs> so um, Undressing the World um, covers a lot of um, my, my experiences as a child and speaking of, of Irish mothers and, and Irish fathers and living in, um, you know, three family house with all the relatives and spilling out into the streets. Um, and uh, I, I resonated with so much of, of what has gone on today. Um, I can't tell you. So um, thank you again. Um, and it, this is the opening poem. Um, it's called My Mother's Hands. Those hands, 87 years of history, imprinted on calloused fingertips, and broad palms that my bottom knows too well. Blue purple veins coursing a map of work, motherhood, and love in all that you've touched. Cutting turf in the bogs of Roscommon, signing your name in a scrawl, pain scrawl in the Ellis Island logbook, caressing the strong thigh 
of the only man you ever loved. Testing TV tubes in the slate gray Newark factory, bathing my tiny body with hard hands gone soft with mother love. Slicing meat for the sandwiches in the college cafeteria, all the education you ever needed, you said. You came home one day from church to find dad still breathless, lying on the couch. Your hands moving over forehead, across cheeks and closed eyes, memorizing his face, resting your head where his once beating heart lay quiet, filled with profound silence. How does grief become so small? It can be carried in the palm of one's hand. Thank you. I had to unmute myself. I knew she'd fit right in with us folks when I heard her at that a few weeks ago. So thank you. Thank you so much for saying yes. And pretty much everyone today who said yes. It's a, I, um, as I joked when I was inviting um, Kathy to join us and to uh, at Irish America writers, I said, she had me at Ogham. Um, you know, how often do you hear that in a poem? So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you so much. We have a surprise. Um, um, and be, before we finish our, our uh, show with uh, David, our inimitable and the what I like to call the, the glue for Irish American writers and artists, in my experience being here for now, maybe two years now, um, has been uh, our salon director. Uh, I believe he's vice president. And Brendan is going to share some of his work. He makes all of our work possible when we do these salons. And it's really a, a time to hear Brendan share some of his work. And just a little bit about Brendan Costello Jr. He teaches creative writing at the City College of New York where he earned his MFA. And uh, he won the Irwin and Alice Stark Award for short fiction. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in the Village Voice uh, Salon Huffington Post, Open Letter Monthly, uh, and Epiphany Magazine. Brendan, Brendan is a former producer and co-host of the largest minority on WBAI radio in New York. And he is the vice president of Irish American Writers and Artists. And please, it is, I'm just thrilled to be, have all of you here, Brendan Costello Jr.'s work. Well, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I should uh, uh, start by saying that um, this is still, uh, this is relatively, I've been thinking about this piece for a long time, but this is relatively um, new and I don't want to say unedited, but let's say in need of more work. Uh, but that's one of the things that a lot of times that we try to do at salons is, is share work in progress. Uh, uh, and um, this, I originally read this last night at an at a, at a venue in downtown New York where they are doing uh, elixirs and herbal remedies and getting kind of into the uh, world of my, uh, mycopharmaceuticals and uh, microdosing. Uh, this is a little bit more about what we might describe as macrodosing. And since we are transatlantic. I feel that there are probably a bunch of people on the West Coast that can can get into this a little bit, perhaps, or and you may know somebody who has had a similar situation. It's called Dark Star, A Formless Reflection. This is a bit about how the dead came back into my life. The signs were subtle at first. There was a 2016 campaign sign for Bernie Sanders utilizing the iconic Steal Your Face logo, an overhead view of a skull with a circle on its cranium. Originally featuring a lightning bolt dividing a blue and red background, the Steal Your Face was customized and adapted for everything and everything, uh, from baseball fandom to art evoking the cosmos. The lyric, I don't know, but I've been told, is hard to run with the weight of gold, surrounded the image of Bernie's face inside the circle. I always liked that song, and it was a clever in the context of the campaign. Then there was the host of an online trivia game, HQ Trivia, who used to drop references to Grateful Dead lyrics in his banter, despite being at least a decade younger than me and seeming to be a pretty straight, yuppified individual who would never have been familiar with anything 
so countercultural or frankly drug adjacent as the Grateful Dead. That's odd, I thought. Following those early signs, I began to notice more clues, references to the whole subculture of Grateful Dead fandom, utilization of their music in some TV shows. And I began to see that more than 50 years after their beginning and 20 years after the death of their iconic co-founder, Jerry Garcia, the dead were back. Then there was a New York Times op-ed about the song Dark Star, about which more later, and an eight-part documentary on Amazon Prime. Of course, fans would say they never left. After Jerry died, Jerry died the remaining members of the band carried on their own versions of the repertoire uh, and have had great success over the years. And the music was always there. At my family's annual Thanksgiving Hootenanny, we'd play one or another of their classic folky tunes like Ripple or Friend of the Devil. But for a long time, the Grateful Dead and their music were an uncomfortable reminder of my misspent youth. I attended high school from 1983 to 87, and for a substantial chunk of that time and a few years after, I was seduced by the dead, their music and the whole scene that went along with them. The dead had subculture had a strong representation in my high school and partly because of the icon iconography and partly because of the kinds of people that were involved, outsiders, rebels, mellow but potentially dangerous individuals who were nonetheless pretty popular. Uh, I was fascinated. And like many other people, I was surprised to hear that despite the skulls and hell's angels kind of iconography, the music was mostly gentle and subtle even when it wasn't. And well, it was strange. Uh, despite the surface simplicity of their folky numbers, there seemed to be an embedded mystery and the long jams in some of their songs, particularly the live renditions, were at once musical and also somehow inscrutable. Was there a point? What was the mystery? Spoiler alert, the mystery was drugs. Psychoactive substances, particularly LSD and mushrooms, were quite literally at the core of the group's founding and aesthetic. Uh, it isn't necessary to have had psychedelic experience to appreciate the dead, even their more esoteric jams. Uh, but once you've had the experience, the music really does take on a different dimension. Listening to their music while under the influence of certain mind-expanding substances, one feels a shock of recognition. These guys know what you're going through. They can sense what you're thinking, or at least they know what you will enjoy. Compared with the other music of the 80s, this was like hearing a secret language or code meant for the enlightened, those who might actually be able to rescue humanity from its seemingly inevitable downward spiral. The profundity of this feeling, combined with the separation from modern culture, lent a certain cosmic significance to every note, even as their music evolved away from the really pioneering and more jagged acid rock of the late 60s. For a time, my reaction may have been exemplified the difference between spirituality and religion. Following the liberating feel, feeling of hearing this expansive and abstract music, I fell into an almost dogmatic devotion to orthodoxy. Every single note, including tuning and mistakes, was sacred and reflective somehow of the universal matrix. I felt an obligation to listen to songs I didn't like out of respect for the band and the work they had done, even though I was only listening to a recording of a concert that had happened months or years or even decades before. This was an aspect of the culture that also fascinated me. Although they had studio albums one could buy in stores, most of their best music was traded between fans, usually on cassettes dubbed for friends and acquaintances. Occasionally, recordings were so many generations old that they were largely static. Learning to perceive the magic in the half-hidden music was a rite of passage in this secret society. It was grassroots, anti-capitalistic, egalitarian, and fun. But my later break with the whole scene and its aesthetic was partly a result of the dissatisfaction I felt with the music as it was being played in the late 80s, as opposed to the late 60s and early 70s, when they were more experimental and, for lack of a better term, gutsy. I would go to concerts, Grateful Dead concerts, expecting an experience like the Avalon Ballroom in 1968. Suffice to say that the parking lot of the Meadowlands Arena in 1988 was not the same environment or the same setting as that storied venue. Their music had evolved, and while there were still glimpses of the old magic, it was not the same. I eventually resented the amount of energy and time I had devoted to this subculture and the degree to which I overlooked its negatives and tried to emphasize its idealistic origins. In retrospect, I seem to have missed out on a lot of other important things while listening to Jerry and company noodling around and spacing out. 
band became enormously popular in the late 80s and a lot of less mellow people flocked to concerts and eventually overloaded a social ecosphere that was fragile even when it was at its most solid. But of course, in large part because of the informal and grassroots uh, method of uh, distributing bootlegs, there were precious few recordings from that era when I felt their music was at its best. When they were still at the forefront of something wild and strange, and they seemed willing to drive not just off the road, but off the planet, and did so nearly every chance they could. So with all these recent proddings and indications of the dead's resurgence, I began to dip back into the waters I had left behind long ago. I soon discovered that many recordings that had been previously been hidden in vaults were now being released and just as quickly shared on YouTube. Thanks to the way we listen to music digitally, it became easy to skip songs I didn't want to hear. And with age, I no longer felt guilty over skipping. And miraculously, there were now hundreds, if not thousands of recordings available online in nearly pristine audio quality to listen to and appreciate. And so it is that I found a new appreciation for their music, for the Dead's music, or at least uh, certain of my favorite songs. And I've delved once again into their cosmic explorations. One of the joys of this rediscovery is I found that I could appreciate the music without needing chemical enhancement. Once one's eyes and ears are open, you can't unhear the magic. In particular, the song Dark Star has always stayed with me. The band starts with a very spare framework, then spins off from that into completely unstructured improvisation, with each member of the band seemingly in conversation with one another while leading the group in different directions. As a result, this could sound like a chaotic mess, and for some it still does. But it also led to rare and precious moments that occasionally evolved into new structured songs, but just as often remained as rare moments of serendipity and beauty. The internet has enabled us to revisit these recordings and appreciate them anew. For me, it feels a bit like discovering a cast of wine from a ship that sank a thousand years ago, but the vintage is still good. Better, perhaps, for its improbable journey from its original port to the ocean floor to a resurrected moment here in 2022. The band's philosophy was always that these moments were meant for the experience in the moment, and as a result, they allowed fans to record their shows Turns out they also recorded a lot of their concerts in that prime era themselves, possibly for commercial release or just for their own reference. Um, as a result, there's always been an odd disconnect, the fetishiz fetishization of recording to relive a moment that one may have not experienced in person. That odd sense of nostalgia for something not experienced was certainly part of my original Deadhead experience. I was a kid in 1988, pining for musical moments that had ended decades earlier. That whole 60s revival was a strange moment of collective nostalgia for a previous generation's culture and aesthetic, an odd phenomenon that had happened before and seems to continue happening up to today. Uh, the present moment always seems lacking in some way, it most certainly did in the 1980s, and we reach back for what feels more authentic or satisfying in some way. Only now, as, I'm, as much as I'm enjoying these old recordings, re-resurrected and restored in electronic form. I'm having a strange added nostalgia. It seems I'm having a nostalgic moment for my own youth when I was indulging vicarious nostalgia for music and culture 20 years previous. Is this a double helix of nostalgia or amoeba strip? Am I finally getting enlightened or re-enlightened? Or am I regressing, avoiding an increasingly frightening present by diving giddily into a pool of sentimental memory? Who can say? My only comment from the deep end is to quote Dave Bauman, the astronaut in 2001 Space Odyssey. My God, it's full of stars. Oh, <laughs> My God, perfect background and oh, yeah, really feeling from the Hubble telescope. The Webb uh, telescope has apparently a better picture, but I think they they're doing something to like copyright all those images so you can't like reuse them oh. <laughs> they've, they've upgraded their their uh, piracy uh, software the new <laughs> well thank you so much thank you thank you really brought brought me back made me think a lot i my favorite one is uncle john's band that's my favorite of the grateful dead um but i i'm a folky and speaking of folky um we're now at our final um our final act, and I always like to end with music, but we're going to begin with just a, a bit of an interview 
And again, I'm so thrilled that he said, yes, I have, I have his seat. So many of these, I have his, this is his face <laughs> that he, how many albums are on here, David? I'm not sure. Five, I think. Actually, I the first 10. Song book. I have first, the song book. Yeah. <laughs> how many albums are on here, David? I'm not sure. Five, I think. Actually, I the first 10. Book. I have first, the song book. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like to just introduce uh, So Thrilled. Um, David, I will chat for a little bit because David has been doing, a, for I don't know how long, uh, tours to Ireland. And he brings a, a small group. He's uh, partnered with, I don't have it right here. But my question is, how long have you been doing these tours? What inspired you to start doing tours? Well, first of all, what a pleasure to be with you all. And Brendan, I love hearing um, what you, you're talking about. One of my songs uh, went up uh, on the space shuttle Atlantis a few years ago on a mission to repair the Hubble telescope. So. You know, I don't know if a song makes a difference in the world or out of this world, but I can now make the claim that uh, my music has been used to help repair, you know, extraterrestrial electronic equipment. Uh, I first started going to Ireland, and the company I work with in Ireland is called Inish Free Tours. It's owned by an Irishman named Paddy Downs from County Clare. And uh, the company had been in effect long before, a few years before I joined on in 2014. And since 2014, I've taken one or two groups of 20 to 23 people uh, on a nine day tour of three counties. This year, we just came back. We did our first tour since the pandemic uh, last month. And Susan Howell is here today, a dear friend of mine from Seattle and was on that tour. Uh, we go to three counties, we spend three nights in three different dwellings so that we're not moving around every day. But by day, we go out in a small coach and we learn about the history of Ireland. And this uh, last month, the counties we visited were, we, we stayed in Donegal, Sligo. We spent the afternoon in Galway City and we ended up in County Clare. Uh, the town was La Hinch. And uh, the company does everything they can to avoid trips to the Blarney Stone, or to avoid the pubs where Irish singers are singing country roads, that sort of thing. They really try to give us an off the beaten path uh, experience of this incredibly beautiful country. And I got involved because a couple of songwriter friends of mine here in the States had been doing this for a few years and they, they told me, oh, you'd be, all you gotta do is get some people together and see if your friends wanna go. And then I get to I get a group of people together here in North America. And uh, then we deliver ourselves to Shannon Airport and into the warm welcome and embrace uh, of Inish Free Tours. They take care of everything. I play music you know, throughout the time, but we also have a private concert by the best local musicians everywhere we go. You know, we've, Kathy Jordan plays for us of Dervish, and we've had Luca Bloom every year in County Clare as well. Uh, but all types of music and dance and harps, and uh, we had Tara Howley before she got really famous with River Dance. She was the uh, Illin, Illin Pipe uh, champion, I believe, or first runner up the most complicated instrument I have ever attempted to play. And I did try to play one once. It's amazing. So it's really gotten in my blood. Uh, uh, even though I'm not of Irish descent, uh, my wife is half Irish. And the first year that we went over there, uh, the fellow looked at, at Trisha's passport. Trisha Duffy, are you Irish? Uh, and she said, well, I'm half Irish and half Italian. And the guy checking the passport said, welcome home. <laughs> How long are you going to be home with us? So I felt only a little bit guilty, you know, taking her back to America where things are so crazy right now, you know. <laughs> I'm looking better and better all the time. Just saying. And Kathy, my mother's from Newark, New Jersey. That's the only other thing I wanted to be sure I said. So there you go. She was the penmanship champion of the state of New Jersey in 1947. So when I go back and I play the coffee houses, I'm so, just a little bit like royalty there, but not very much, you know, as the son of the penmanship champion. <laughs> So I don't want to hold up too much more from letting everyone hear your terrific music and you've just got a, just a terrific voice. I, I, uh, I do have a full intro, but I, I think I'll just say I happen to feel David Roth is someone who brings joy and light and kindness throughout all his music. And he, um, he's America's troubadour and much, many more Americans need to know about the work and the music of David Roth. I just a huge fan. Um, and 
I just want to ask one more question before you go into your song, which is what was it like touring after the pandemic in Ireland? What was it like? Really good question. And right up until, uh, you know, the week that we left, some people were a little bit on the, on the edge about going over there because we had heard reports from the previous tours this year that the pubs were crowded, no one was wearing masks. And um, uh, Patty Downs told me that the vaccination rate uh, was over 98% in Ireland. Now, you know, done a lot of study about this. The vaccination, as we've come to discover, is not a shield against getting COVID, but it can reduce symptoms, you know, in varying degrees for people who might contract the virus. Um, we approached it with respect and care. And when I write out the word careful, I write C-A-R-E dash F-U-L-L, full of care. We, were, uh, we wore masks for the most part on the bus. We kind of watched what other people were doing. Um, and you know, by the middle of the tour, we were going on as if nothing in the world had changed that much. You know, the masks kind of went by the wayside. We were still being being full of care, and remarkably, nobody in our group got any any illness at all. I think one fellow had sniffles the last day, and he wore a mask just because he didn't know what he had. So we were lucky, and we were conscious about it. Uh, but to go over there, you might not know that anything had happened, uh, except that in one town where we stopped for lunch, there was a big sign in front of a hotel that said, uh, we are closed for you know, public tourism. We are currently hosting our Ukrainian guests who need a roof over their heads. Until this is over, uh, we'll see you on the other side. Words to that effect. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Very, very moving. Um, so I would I just thank you again, and I know you're you're a busy man because you're now hosting a songwriting festival. Uh, behind you, you're in Stony Point or Stony Brook? Stony Point, New York, which is north and west of New York City in what's called Rockland County. And uh, we're just convening today. Everybody's arriving, so if you hear strains of guitars or noises or things in the background, I just grabbed a room here, and I'm using the signal through my telephone. Uh, so that I can zoom to you guys today. Thank There's you. way too much to talk about as far as Ireland goes. I have nothing but great respect for the, the artists and writers uh, in this salon and that beautiful, soulful country where we can learn so much you know, about how humans treat each other. Yes, and so please share a song. Thank you very much, David. All right, all right. Thank you very much, David. All right, briefly to introduce this song, the great Irish historian P.J. Curtis was giving us a lecture on the history of Irish music in 2014 in a pubs one afternoon. And um, this song kind of came up for me. I'm sure it was inspired in part by hearing the parting glass every night in the pubs, but I wanted to create something that I felt was a meaningful way of saying thank you for being together until we meet again. And thanks for having me. The big hand of the mighty clock Goes turning fast and faster Where has the time gone? I don't know The hourglass no one can master Gone away is all the past Right to this very moment For now I'll simply raise a glass to all we have in common. And now we go our separate ways. We came as strangers, leave as friends. I wish you well in all your days until we meet again. And the greatest distance in this world is not from pole to pole, but rather from the head to heart, from soul to soul to soul. And here we are together now, and standing side by side. I offer you my hand and hope I'll see you by and by. For now we go our separate ways We came as strangers, leave as friends I wish you well in all your days Until we meet again
And the sun may shine at different times For some and not for others So bring the light where'er you go My sisters and my brothers May every blade of grass you tread Point in your right direction and every movement that you make rekindle our connection. For now we go our separate ways. We came as strangers, leave as friends. I wish you well in all your days until we meet again. Oh, now we go our separate ways. We came as strangers, leave as friends. I wish you well in all your days until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Did my heart good. I feel like that's a beautiful sum for this whole salon, too. Until we meet again, I, we came as strangers, many of us, and leaving as friends. And I hope we stay connected. And that was beautiful, David. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, are, we, are we doing one more? Or, that was, or, or is that it? I, I don't want to. I don't want to rush you off the stage here, you know. I'm sitting in a chair after driving for five hours. I got to go meet my people. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We, well, we had we, said yeah. one. So, yeah. Thank you, David. Okay. Well, thank we'll you so much. We'll have to have you back. Yeah. yeah. I would be honored. And then when you do, just call me David O'Roth. I'm with you in every way that I possibly can. <laughs> okay. um, we also, if you have info about either the current, if you have like a, like a, like a link or something for the current songwriting thing or you know, the next time you do one, uh, let us know. We can help cross promote it. And next time you're down in the city or near the city, we can maybe we can, you know, have you part of our another salon or whatever. But great work. Thank you very much. I'd be more than honored. And yeah, if you can find me at David Roth Music, it's just like David Lee Roth without the yeah. Lee. <laughs> but davidrothmusic.com and uh, information about my trips to Ireland and uh, other places. Uh, is there as well as a, a touring schedule that's just starting to now kick up into gear again after two years. Uh, I, my only challenge is to see if I can remember how to sing standing up, you know, so I've been doing <laughs> so. <laughs> All, right, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much again. I'm going to bring Catherine back. Hang on one sec. Here we go. And yeah, ba boom. There you go. Hi. Well done, everybody. I think that was a lovely, lovely selection. And uh, thanks again to Laurie for all your, the work you did on this. I, I did a little bit, but not anything like as much as you did. So appreciate that. Thank you, Brendan. And um, I, I would just uh, let me just interrupt. I'm sorry. But I think we should all give uh, uh, Catherine and Laurie a big hand for the great work they did for hosting today. Thank you guys very much. Put together a wonderful group. And uh, thanks to everybody who participated. But let me get you let get you back to your thing. I just want to make sure we acknowledge you guys. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, I know it's getting late in Ireland and um, to get, get to your Betty buys over there. Um, I hope we can continue to do this. I'm, I'm very happy to have Irish Culture Bay Area reach out past the Bay Area, past San Francisco, um, to New York, to Ireland, to Europe. We need to, to work together more than we have. And I think this is happening. So thank you all. Yeah. Um, so for, if you want to just, we can, you, we can, uh, hang out and chat. People want to chat or, uh, uh, you know, you know, drop off as, as need be, or if anybody has any other announcements they want to make, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, Catherine, are you going to say something? Um, uh, I have to pop, pop out now to take my son's dog for a walk. He's giving me the evil eye here. So. Your son or the dog? <laughs> well, both, both the, the dog, and I'll get that for my son if I don't do this. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna love you and leave you all. And um, what a, what a, what a lovely afternoon of splendid, um, you, art and talent. Thanks yeah. again. Bye. Yeah. Thanks everybody, and and check out this the chat. Um, when we do Can get you our stop the recording. Do you want to? Oh yeah, I'll I'll stop the recording now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless anybody has anything really important they want to get in the recording before we turn it off. <laughs> Too late. <laughs>